to the Mystery Bible on podcast. For those of you joining us on video, this is the first time we've ever recorded on video, but much more importantly than that, we have the guest that we have been talking about for a long time. We are joined today by Mr. Timothy Alberino. For those of you who have been following the Mystery Bible on podcast since we started uh, just as an idea some years ago, one of the books that we have referred to most frequently is Birthright by Tim Alberino. We've done more episodes on that book, and it's been uh, our highest rated and most viewed episodes as well. And we always joked that maybe someday if we hit it big, then Tim would join us. And today, here he is. So we're very thankful to have Tim Alberino joining us here in our virtual studio. You also have Mr. Brian Brown and Mr. Dan Rundio, your fearless trifecta of co-hosts as always. We talked with Tim a little bit before we hit record about the different things that we could cover. And there's a, a lot of, there's so much material. So we have a, a handful of questions. And I wanted to start with a rather broad question that is a little bit amorphous and uh, a little bit wide, but I think it can get the conversation rolling, even if we talk about what we could talk about in the question. So Tim, you've written Birthright. You've uh, led expeditions into Peru recently. You've been on podcasts and interviews all over the place. You've been up to speed on current events, and you've become something of a uh, of, of a sought out voice in the space. What, however, we define this space. Um, and one of the things I I wanted to start with is what, what's clarified for you in recent years. What have you learned? Um, and then we'll get into some specifics about things that you would do differently in your book or add to the book or, or change. How has your perspective been evolving in this space? And what do you think we should be paying attention to that maybe you didn't see uh, in the past? So let's let's start with that. If you want any clarification, I'm, I'm happy to provide it. But I like starting nice and broad so that we can hear kind of where you're at these days. And also, Thanks for joining us. We're so glad that you're here and we haven't leaked this to our audience. They're going to be so excited because all of them are familiar with Tim Alberino. And we're very grateful for the work you've done so far. Well, I'm happy to be with you, gentlemen, for this conversation. Thanks for having me on. Um, in regard to what I've learned, um, let's say since the publishing of my book, I would modify the question a little bit because um, I'm not sure that I can answer that question um, I'd have to think about it for a long time, but I can tell you at least one thing that I have, um, let's say one view that I have updated, let's put it in those terms. And that would be my perspective on the flood of Noah. When I wrote Birthright, I was uh, aware of, but not yet well-versed in some scientific data relating to what's called the Younger Dryas Impact Hypothesis. Now, for those of you who've read my book, Birthright, you'll note that when I talk about the flood of Noah, although I think in the book I provide a date, the date of 3300 BC for the advent of the flood, I'm pretty sure that I've also included a footnote um, referencing the Younger Dry's Impact Hypothesis and the possibility of a of, of a much later date for the flood of Noah, and that date being 10,000 BC. So I've modified that view since the publishing of the book, and I it's hard for me. Let's because I, as you well know, the the material in Birthright is is quite broad, um, and so I'm thinking through. Uh, the subject matter. And I don't think that I really have changed my opinions or thoughts or even really evolved much uh, in regard to those other topics. Um, but certainly, if I, w if, if I could go back, and I'm kind of answering your second question here too, if I could go back and and update something in that book, it would be in regard to the dating of the flood. Um, I was... In the book, I do express my doubt in regard to the traditional timeline that most Christians are aware of, that being the rendering in the Masoretic text. Uh, the Masoretes, for some reason, circumcised 100 years off of the lifespans of the pre-flood pre patriarchs, at least when 
the Masoretic text is compared with the Septuagint, which is, of course, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. And I'm not sure why they decided to do this, uh, but the Septuagint version of the Old Testament, the specifically in regard to the uh, Genesis 5 genealogy of the pre-flood pre patriarchs, it, it, it adds... 100 years, or rather the Masoretic text subtracts 100, 100 years from the lifespans of those patriarchs from Adam to Noah, as rendered, as reckoned in the Septuagint. I'm not sure why the Masoretes decided to do that. I'm sure they had their own um, theological presuppositions that they were working with, and they made some alterations to the, to the Hebrew Bible based on on you might you might call it doctoral decisions that they made and I'm not sure if this qualifies as uh, one of those decisions but have you, have you heard the Melchizedek theory around there where they they wanted specifically to make sure that Melchizedek's timeline didn't work out that's I've seen that come up a few times I don't know I if it's something you wanted to comment on I have heard that as one of the explanations um and so you have a problem right off the bat here, and, and I did address this in the book. I, I um, prefer the Septuagint's reckoning of the timeline from Adam to Noah. And obviously, if you're going to have 100 years, and I've got it somewhere in my notes. I don't have it in front of me, though. What, whatever, how, however many hundreds of years that adds it's on like to six, the timeline. It's like 600 but, years. Something like that, yes. Thank you. So, it's which is significant, which is significant. So, yeah, we have in Protestant Christians, we have a very nice, tight timeline. Most denominations are working with this very tight timeline, mathematical um, calculation from Adam to Noah, from Adam to the flood of Noah not from Adam to Noah, rather from Adam to the flood of Noah. And it's, it's, it's accepted as, as, um, as fact based on the, the plain calculation that one can make from the Masoretic text. Um, automatically, when you fall back to the Septuagint, as you said, you get, you get hundreds of years added onto this equation, added into this equation, which just throws that timeline off. Um, but it gets worse because, and I did, again, I did allude to this in the book. Um, when you, when you consider the, the, the genealogy from Adam to Noah, it is assumed, it is presumed that we're looking at the father and then the firstborn son, and then the father and the firstborn son down through the family line. That is not necessarily the case. There is really good scholarship on a phenomenon known as telescoping as it pertains to genealogies in the Bible. And we know that certain genealogies in the biblical texts, Old and New Testament, uh, have been subjected to telescoping. And what telescoping means is exactly what the name implies. We all know that you can take a telescope and you can extend it. You can extend it out, or if you have a telescope that's fully extended, you can withdraw it, right? You can shorten it. So um, why would the biblical writers want to either extend or truncate a genealogy? Well, the the reasoning is, is quite simple, because they were often very much... Um, they were often very much concerned with the numerology as concerned with the numerology, that final number that they were going to land on in that genealogy as they were with getting it, getting the names and, and, and the actual data uh, registered. So the, in other words, we know that there are certain numbers in the biblical text that are very important to the writers, the number three, for example, the number seven, the number 40, and so on, and the number 70. Um, and the, all of these numbers, they they had a meaning, and so it was advantageous 
to if you're going to express something, if you're going to record the genealogy of, of a family line, it's advantageous to have that genealogy fit within one of these particular numbers to to add additional communication or certification onto the genealogy. And this isn't my opinion that we know that this is done. It's there's there's a few examples. I don't have my notes in front of me on telescoping, but the audience can look it up. Tell the, the phenomenon of telescoping. It's well known. It's well documented, and it's it's a fact. It's a biblical fact. And so, if we assume that, like other genealogies, the pre-flood genealogy, the pre-flood pre-flood patriarchal genealogy has been subjected to telescoping. And in this case, it wouldn't be in an elongation, rather it would be a truncating of the genealogy in order to fit a particular number. Then there's simply no way to calculate how old, how many years transpired between Adam and the flood of Noah. It could be many more thousands of years, let alone hundreds. So you have right, right away, um, we have to admit that the Masoretic rendering of the Genesis 5 genealogy, genealogy is most likely not accurate. The Septuagint's rendering is, for several reasons, I believe, going to be more accurate. Um, and well, the then Dead Sea we have Scrolls to make a, The Dead Sea Scrolls manuscripts make a really good argument for, for uh, the older, which would match the Septuagint. That's right. Predating the Masoretic text and, and therefore being more reliable. Well, That's right. The, Sept and, the Septuagint was the one that was quoted from in the New Testament primarily because the Masoretic text wasn't formula, wasn't finished off till what, like 250 AD? Precisely so, right. So so the, the, the early church was reading the Septuagint. Yeah, for sure. And uh, and and so this how this leads into what I would have modified – uh, I had always had a problem because I had constrained myself within. I gave myself the flexibility of the Sep, of the Septuagint's rendering of the Genesis five genealogy, which gave me hundreds of more years to play with in terms of when did the flood happen, right? How, or uh, how far back does a human race go? When was the inception of mankind? Um, so I had, I knew I had some flexibility, but the problem I was running into was as I was traveling around the world, I've been traveling around the world for for decades, and as I was studying the megaliths, the various megalithic sites I've been to around the world, I was noticing that so many of them were aligned, and they're aligned mainly to axial precession. They're aligned to particular zodiacal house mainly. I mean, in short, there's a long explanation and there's different constellations. It gets very complex, but in short, many of the megaliths I believe that their their alignment is the timestamp of their construction. They the builders literally timestamped when they laid the foundations of these megaliths um, by their alignment. For example, we know now that the Sphinx was originally aligned with um, the zodiacal house of Leo. Uh, which why is that important? Because it tells you the age in which it was constructed, and that happens to be ten thousand BC. Uh, the same can be said for the city of Cusco, the alignment of the megaliths in the city of Cusco. Um, and, and for dozens and dozens of important megalithic sites around the world, so many of them are pointing to the age of Leo, which is 10,000 BC. For the benefit of our listeners, the, the, dating, the, the, the way that dating works is there's a, a slight but measurable drift over time in the constellations relative to each other. And so you can you can kind of back up in the timeline to see where precise alignments would have, uh, wh where those conjunctions would have happened for those alignments. And so when you look at something and say, you know, this is a, a couple of degrees off from being perfectly aligned, and then you run the clock backwards and go, oh, well, when we get back to 10,000 right. BC, then, then it's no longer off. It is perfectly aligned, which makes sense given the precision of the engineering that we see in so many of those megaliths. Precisely right. And that's because of axial precession. We all know the earth wobbles and, um, and the, it's very complex, but the, most people are aware that there's this thing called the Zodiac and it has 12 houses in it. And less people should become alarmed at my mention of the Zodiac. The Hebrews, the ancient Hebrews had the same system. It was called the Matzeroth. Same thing. It's the very same thing. The 12 houses of the Matzeroth. Um, I don't think there's fact, anybody that 
that didn't have it. And it's weirdly consistent across ancient cultures. The Very zodiac, so. is, it's always been there and they've always had the same names and it's like they were all getting them from the same source or something. That's what right. A surprise. That's right. Because the, the times that rather the, the stars and the sun and the moon and the heavenly bodies are for the calculation of time, according to the Bible. And, and so it makes sense that there would be a universal calendar that has, um, that we have received from our antecedents, from all the way, I believe this is knowledge that was given to Adam and, and began in the antediluvian world. And so that's why, in, that's why it's been, uh, that's why it's so ubiquitous around the world and has been perpetuated through so many different cultures and civilizations. Now, there's some slight differences, but for the most part, the calendars align. Um, and in fact, we don't have to go down this path very far, but in fact, there's a lot, I would say there's quite a few, uh, there's quite a few oracles in the Old Testament, prophecies in the Old Testament that are directly related to the Matzeroth. And I think we miss it because we've assumed that the Zodiac and the signs of the Zodiac, that that is all pagan and that's all astrology and that's all witchcraft when in fact it's just a measurement of time. That's all it is. It is a measurement which, of time. Which we're told is exactly the, the purpose of those. We actually just did an episode, a, a few episodes ago, we had Ken Johnson on to discuss the Dead Sea Scrolls calendar, and he's going to a lot of work to try and reconcile the ancient calendars with the modern calendars based on some of the findings in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So this has been a very, it's been a, a, a recent topic that we've we've spent some time on. So I think you're, uh, people are probably nodding along. We haven't talked about it from the Maseroth and, Zo and the Zodiac set, but I think the uh, you know the, the the point that that you're making is that this seemed to be this seemed to be something that was taken seriously across cultures and across time. And when you run it backwards and start paying attention to it, there seems to be an intersection somewhere in the ballpark of 10,000 BC. Exactly. So uh, this was my conundrum that I was working through. I was constraining myself. Again, I gave myself the, f the flexibility of the, of the Septuagint's reckoning of the Genesis 5 gene genealogy. So I was working with hundreds of more years than most Christians were accustomed to. But it wasn't hundreds of more years that I needed in order to um, make sense of the alignment of the megaliths. It was thousands of years that I needed. And, uh, and I'm the kind of guy that I go where the data leads me. And if I'm finding consistently these, obviously, these antediluvian megalithic foundations that are, that are purposely aligned um, to the age of Leo, 10,000 BC, then something's wrong with my calculation. I'm not going to pretend that that's not the case. I have to adjust my view. And so um, I, I, so I gradually was coming to this understanding that the flood of Noah probably took place many thousands of years earlier than we than we originally thought, or that most again most Christians are accustomed to thinking. And it just so happens that that time frame, some twelve thousand years ago, we have a it aligns with a hypothesis that is is gaining um, always continually gaining more and more credibility in the scientific community, and that is called the Younger Dry's Impact Hypothesis, which in short um, posits that some 12,000 years ago, um, there was a catastrophic event that devastated planet Earth. And it was a, it was a, a massive cataclysm that was catalyzed by fragments of an asteroid breaking off and bombarding the earth specifically the the ice sheets in the northern hemisphere and even more specifically the laurentide ice sheet north america for sure and probably other places along in the northern hemisphere and this this cataclysm uh caused all kinds of um havoc on every continent on planet earth including flooding, massive flooding. If you lived in a, coast, in, a, in, a, in a coastal area or on the bank of a river, which most of civilization did, you were completely annihilated. Um, this, this 
information, this we can call it new information, it's been coming out over the last decade or so. Um, Graham, Han Graham Hancock and um, Randall Carlson. And Randall Carlson have popularized the view. And I've been in contact with uh, at least one of the uh, scientists involved in the project um, and have watched uh, the documentary on NOVA. NOVA did a great documentary on the Younger Dryas Impact Hypothesis. Um, it's, it is, uh, again, it's gaining, it's gaining ground in, in regard to its acceptance in the scientific community. And it is, it is becoming more and more apparent that this is, in fact, what happened. And so I believe that the younger dry dries impact, the younger dries impact event was the the flood of Noah was the great flood as recorded in the in the biblical corpus, uh, but also the great cataclysm that's recorded by by almost every ancient, in fact, every primary ancient civilization on Earth, that they're all referencing the same event, and that event uh, is. The Younger Dryas Impact Hypothesis sometime around 10,000 BC. Now, the fallout of the of those impacts, um, there would have, there would have been an immediate catastrophic destruction. That that there would have been um, biomass burning all over the uh, all over the planet, uh, raging wildfires. There would have been uh, from the discharge of the impact of the of the asteroid fragments. Uh, there would have been obviously. Um, a a liquefaction, an instantaneous liquefaction of millions of uh, of gallons, trillions of gallons of water um, from the uh, from the um, ice sheets that would have that would have in in tidal form fashion rushed into the ocean, poured into the ocean. I mean, it would have been, it would have been a, you know, mile high tidal wave rushing across North America. Uh, it would have caused, it would have caused the same kind of devastation all over the coastal regions of, of every continent on planet earth. You would have had mile high tidal waves crashing into the shores of, of, of every continent. You would have had earthquakes, huge earthquakes, just rocking the earth. Um, it would have led to something um, approximating a nuclear winter, where you would have you would have a, a a vaporizing at the at ground zero where the impacts were happening. You would have you know the immediate area would be vaporized like a nuclear blast. Um, but so you'd have this this heat event that would be preceded by a deep freeze because all of that ash and debris that's thrown up into the atmosphere would would block out the sun. And the Earth would be thrown into an ice age, and Which all of this was. Seems to be confirmed in the geological record. What's fascinating to me about the data you said follow the data is that they have taken so many disciplines to work together to come up to make sure that the data was accurate. They've got microferrules, which was incurred, right. was from the heat. They've got tree ring data, ice core data. And they've been able to correlate all of this. And they even said, well, if it happened in one part of the hemisphere versus another, we're going to see different things, but they were able to corroborate it from the North Pole and the South Pole. Like, it's it's an amazing piece of work that they've done. Now, let, it, let me... Yes, it is. I, I, I want to throw kind of a, a twist into the conversation, because what, what you are proposing is, what if the timeline between Adam and Noah is a lot longer than we thought? And what if there was a lot more civilization and potentially a lot more catastrophism that occurred in there. And that's a, a, a very interesting and and based on the data, as you guys are describing, a, a very reasonable hypothesis and has a lot of support and especially a lot of geologic support. How would you respond to the idea that and, and I'm I'm asking this because I know you've you've done work with uh Pember's stuff. Uh you're I'm assuming you're probably familiar with uh Manuel Velikovsky and some of these other mm -hmm. catastrophism approaches. And it seems to me that our solar system is in something of a state of of ruin and possibly in a state of that tohu vabohu that we see in that genesis 1 1 genesis 1 2 uh state so how would you respond to to the idea that um the earth was formless and void it was tohu vabohu and something catastrophic had happened 
when we arrive in Genesis one two on in in this in this creation narrative where Yahweh is saying, hey, let's let's reorganize this from a state of chaos because we don't see a fresh, pure, clean earth. You know, we, it's it's not created from from you know brand new there's something that happened in the past possibly that you know i'm throwing in shattering of rahab and, and some of these ideas that i know you're familiar with do you think that there's a possibility that some of those very very old megaliths were already here when uh the adam narrow narrative started from the elder race that's another that's another possibility sure uh, there is a possibility that the foundations of the largest megaliths on earth such as Baalbek, for example the walls of saksai Waman, um, Maybe that, Gobekli Tepe and some of these, just these ones that are just that are just possibly, although Gobekli frustratingly Tepe, old. Gobekli Tepe is is indicating ten thousand BC thereabouts. Okay. Yeah. Um, but uh, it it is, and again, again, the problem here is let's go back to the alignments. Although I do concede that that is plausible. Certainly, we have this issue of the alignments. They're aligned with axial precession to particular ages to particular. Zodiacal signs, and and you have to take that into account. Um, and when you do, you you are so many so often you're getting ten thousand BC. So um, I would say that the majority, if not all, of the megalithic foundations on Earth were constructed uh, up until ten thousand BC, and some of them specifically at that time within that window. And, and again, some of them possibly previous to that date, but probably within a window of, of some thousands of years. Is it possible that what we're looking at is the residue of some kind of pre-Adamic angelic civilization, the ruins of some, of some non-human civilization that pre-existed us? That's certainly possible, certainly. Um, and I do posit in my book that the earth was inhabited previous to Adam, but I would say that the devastation of planet earth was such that that nothing would have survived. There are several places in the, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, where, for example, several places in the Psalms, which I cannot, I cannot pull off the top of my head right now, they're, they're registered in my book, in which the earth appears to be, in, to, to be observing, uh, rather appears to be a bystander observing the destruction in the cosmos. And then you have, and then you have um, phrases like, as it pertains to the earth and the destruction that the fallout that that um, that came as a result and devastated the earth, you have these phrases like the mountains melted like wax. Yeah. Now, if you have a let's assume that's literal. If you have mountains melting like wax, there's no way that the megalithic foundations of a stone structure are going to survive that. They're also going to melt like wax and probably quicker than the mountain, than the bedrock of the mountain. So True. Um, I think that uh, I'm absolutely, totally open to the idea that there was a pre-Adamic angelic civilization or some other kind of civilization inhabiting planet Earth previous to the human species, but that the destruction, the cataclysm that destroyed the earth before the creation of Adam was so calamitous, so devastating that the mountains did in fact melt like wax and that every vestige of that civilization is gone, absolutely gone. Um, that, would, that would have certainly left the earth in the state that we find it in the opening chapters of Genesis, would it not? That tohu vabohu would, this, this without form, this notion of without form, um, it would have What's left it? the earth in, in exactly the state that that uh, that we that we find it in the. What's interesting, and, and part of why I bring that up is because when we so it it, it so happens that the the church where I help teach here in Monument, Colorado, uh, I kicked off a Genesis series uh, last Sunday, and this coming Sunday, the 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 head pastor is teaching Genesis one one and one two. So I've been spending a lot of time on this recently. And, and we are, uh, you know, so there are some people who are hearing these kinds of things for the first time. Not, our whole congregation, obviously, is not a mystery Bible I'm listener. The people who listen to the podcast are way ahead in the in these areas. Yet. But when I look, yeah, not yet. Well, they'll get there if I'm still around after a few more Sundays. We'll see. Uh, so when we look at that Tohu Vabohu state, though, one thing that is consistent through, and I'm, I'm not arguing with you, I'm speculating about what this what this may have been because the the short answer is we don't know but something happened and uh 
there's always this description of weird things that live in that chaos. And the these English translations struggle to describe the what the uh, you know what the the Hebrew terms are where they say, oh, it, it'll be a state of Tohu Vabohu where the owl and the hedgehog live. And we're going, well, what is that really? And the answer is we don't really know. But the more we look into those terms, the more they seem to be these strange spiritual beings that are that occupy these these lonely wastelands of something that had been there and was destroyed and it is a state of, of punishment and condemnation. And, and and I just want to highlight that, that that is the phrase that is used to describe the the state of the earth when we get to Genesis 1 1 and Genesis 1 2. So it, it it's it's like we're saying way back when God created the heavens and the earth. Now our narrative begins when. And the kind of of uh what Tim Alberino is, is speculating about here is the w- w- what may have come before, what may have come after, but the sorts of things that when we look back, we go something massive was going on before. So let, let's say for the sake of argument that that your original hypothesis is correct, that there's a telescoping of the uh, of the genealogy, that there's just a very long period of time between Adam and Noah, and and there may have been and there's still there's something very very different about what was going on in the earth at that time there's mankind must have been a lot different if we're going back to this original creation state where the kind of megaliths that you're describing are being built and designed are are you attributing all of that to elder race nephilim hybrid beings or do you think man was something else i think there's at least three plausible options here you could have had the megaliths maybe were erected by the watchers or were erected by their hybrid offspring, the Nephilim, or were erected by by the men of the antediluvian world. These were not apish cavemen. The men who lived in the past, and again, according to the biblical narrative, these guys were living hundreds of years. Can you imagine, for example, being a Mason? You know, you're going to be a journeyman, you're going to study under a master mason, but instead of studying under that mason for 10 years, you study under that mason for 100 years, because you're going to live 700 years. And you then then you then develop your skill and mastery of masonry for 500 more years or whatever it would be, right? Um, and presumably with a much better genetic code and, along the way, right, so your brain probably works exactly, better. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yep. So you have the full, uh, near, the near full capacity of human biology at your disposal, which we do not have currently. We are really broken down, crappy versions of Adam. We are degenerate, and that is a fact. Unfortunately for us, we are genetic. Uh, we are ge- we have genetically degenerated from our original progenitor, the, the, the prototypical human being, Adam. And Adam was created, and it only, it's only logical to assume that Adam was created uh, to be a perfect specimen. Why would he have been created with any defaults, with any defects, rather, genetic defects? He wasn't. He was, he was firing on all cylinders. Uh, he, had, he had the full capacity of his brain, which we do not. He had the full capacity of his brain. Um, he had the full capacity of his body, of his brawn. Let's say he was he was functioning at one hundred percent brains and brawn, uh, well, which a means lot, he, a lot like Dan Rundio. <laughs> I'm sure that's true. Yeah. Uh, so he was he was he was unimaginably intelligent and unimagin- un, 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 unimaginably robust, physically robust, strong. Uh, and, uh, and, and also I think that this is my speculation, obviously I've got very, very good reasons to speculate in this direction, but I believe that the human species is, is, was originally telepathic. I'm, I think I'm that, so happy you're going here because I was, I was actually had this on my menu of let's go to Babel and see what we think that actually was. Uh, well, I think that human communication was was first and foremost telepathic. We've always used our mouths to to vocalize, but but that was secondary form of communication. The primary form of communication for the human species, again, my speculation, is that we were telepathic. It was telepathy. And I believe that is the higher form of communication. Well, we um, see that consistently. I'm excited, so I'm interrupting you. Uh, forgive me. But we, we see that consistently when we look at, we just did episodes on near-death experiences with uh, John Burke, for example. That's a very consistent um, 
a report from people who have experienced these these mystical things that the communication is telepathic. And then when you get to the darker side of the spectrum, whether it's with uh, cryptid interactions or uh, much less pleasant mystical experiences, there is a consistency of telepathic communication. So there's it, in that case, then going back to it wouldn't have just been an apprenticeship of 100 years uh, for that hypothetical stonemason we described, it would have been a complete ability to communicate, understand, and and operate as a unit between to mm -hmm. higher beings in 100 years. And, and by the way, that idea of of mankind, uh, of previous man being better than modern man, I mean, that wasn't really flipped around till till Darwin. If, if you, When you read Apocalypse of Ezra or Jubilees or Jasher or some of these older texts, then it's kind of taken for granted that everybody knows that the predecessors were more. And you get these stories that involve these almost superhuman feats. Universally. By, yeah, yeah, it's it's everywhere, and and so the, that seems to be taken for granted. And then you throw in there the the possibility that that the communication was so much better, and I speculate that that's possibly what was lost at Babel, and it's an absolute game changer. Isn't it amazing that every ancient civilization regarded their antecedents to be superior, except for us, hmm. modern the modern man we regard ourselves to be the pinnacle of evolution, and everybody before us was was less intelligent i always bring and, up c.s lewis and chronological snobbery right we always think we're better that's right yeah. and, and, and and nothing could be further from the truth yes we have technology um but strip strip our technology away from us and and um there's not a whole lot to boast about in regard that's to our fact. intellectual capacity um and it's in the the megaliths are a testament to an intelligence that exceeds modern man's intelligence in some regard. Um, I'm not yeah. saying that, you know, I always tell people don't go looking for laptops and Lamborghinis among the megalithic ruins. You're not going to find that kind of technology because we've taken a very particular path, uh, a, a, a particular technological path, but there are many. We do electromagnetism and combustion, you know, and so forth. But these are, these are just, we use a handful of options of technological tools when there are probably yeah. dozens and dozens more. I mean, we certainly do have not mastered the totality. And our, our the technology, our technology is very much a product of, of our kind of Greek dualism of separating material from spiritual and everything else. But when you look at how the the previous how the ancient technologies might have worked it seems like they had an understanding of of matter and our experience reality being a subset of something larger and they were able to tap into that you you get these examples of uh you know the very old legends about uh, easter island for example and they say well how did they move these massive statues and they say well they they sang them down the mountain or and you get these weird statements we're going how how does that even work and, and it seems like there's this this ability to manipulate sound and vibration and frequency in order to get these kinds of manipulations of matter that we really can't explain almost like even and i know you've talked about in the megalithic walls these these softened rocks that look like they were smushed together and we're going we have no in, in our newtonian physics we have no way to explain that now and then there's speculation that as we get closer to quantum theory and perhaps some of the things that are going on at cern there's this, this reintegrating of this this spookier uh, non-physical reality, and we're starting to redevelop the appreciation for these two things are not actually separated from each other, and you can manipulate one with the other if you understand how to work the spiritual technology. It gives you a real leg up on working the the physical reality as well. And I think somewhere in the last you know many hundred years, we we've we haven't believed that, and we're starting to believe it again. It, yeah, you have stories of uh, all all around the world, as you said. You have stories of of large stones being levitated in various ways. For example, the blowing of trumpets. Um, uh, well, the blowing of trumpets is interesting because how did uh, how did how did Joshua and the army bring down the walls of Jericho right. precisely with sound? So I think that they were simply undoing what was done using the same mechanism, which was waveform. Um, and again, speculating here, but um, I think that we've taken an inferior path, a technological path to some extent. That that's evident to me when when you start to 
research or observe, as I have with my own eyes, advanced aerospace technology that is that is in circulation today, whether it's our own technology that's been derived from some scientific principles that have not been that have not been disclosed to the public, or whether it's alien technology, or whether it's alien technology that's been reverse engineered. Obviously, we're driving around in our fancy vehicles, and we think that because our new vehicles have are are computerized and and have you know um, voice recognition recognition and GPS and so forth that they're technologically advanced. Well, we are driving around in what <laughs> in what might be described as the equivalent of the Flintstones car compared to you know, the Tesla truck and that comparison, we're the Flintstone. Our greatest technology is the Flintstone car. And in this scenario, in this comparison, and a, and a flying saucer is the, is a Tesla truck. I mean, right. um, obviously we do not publicly, publicly, we do not understand the full spectrum of what we call physics. Uh, and it's not that these things, by the way, are breaking the laws of physics. It's simply that we have an incomplete picture of the natural world. We simply you, have not come to understand the full spectrum of the natural forces and how to apply them to technology and fabricate useful things with them. And it's it's not a stretch of the imagination to think about the ancients walking a different technological path and arriving at remarkable technologies much quicker than we would because they've gone down a better path. They're, they're harnessing forces um, that don't require um, the same sort of mechanisms that we have to build in order to do what we do. Um, we, we need to generate a lot of energy uh, to drive our cars, and, and that's in the form of combustion. And so we have to make – we basically the way that we make our machines move is we blow stuff up. That's the basic principle of how we make our machines move. We're switching to batteries now. We're switching to a, a, a more of an a, a electric, electromagnetism. But, um, but most of us are still driving around in – our cars are being powered. We're driving, around, we're driving around in vehicles that are being powered by controlled explosions, right? That's one very, I would say, probably, probably very elementary – and and perhaps even we can use the word crude type of technology that we think is very advanced. The but in comparison is, is, to what? It's advanced in comparison to what? So right. I don't believe that the ancients had Lamborghinis and, and laptops. I think they had a completely different technological path. Um, in some ways, probably our uh, communication technologies exceed anything that was – achieved in the past I, I i would venture to guess we've we have made significant significant uh, progress in communication technology that might be something approximating something new although i think i would echo solomon's words that there's really nothing new under the sun but um but in regard to other kinds of technology they and, and i think it's important to 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 identify to, to return to these three groups I mentioned and start to think about what this dynamic might have looked like in the antediluvian world. So I, I talked about the watchers who were the apostate sons of God who defected from the kingdom of heaven in the days of Jared, according to the book of Enoch. Um, then you have their, their unsanctioned hybrid offspring who were the giants of old. Uh, they were, um, they were part, part, Watcher, let's say I call them the elder race, by the way, not the giants, but the this angelic race. I call them the elder race. So they would have been part elder race, part human race. Um, and then we have and then we have remarkable human beings at the same time. So all three of these, all three of these players are in the game at the same time in the antediluvian world, at least from the days of Jared onward. And so when you look at megaliths, you know, the, the explanation, returning to that question, the explanation for who built them could be any of these. By the way, there is no reason to assume, as so many do, and I did at one time as well, there is no reason to assume that it's just the bad guys building all the, all the cool stuff all over the world in regard to megaliths. I mean, why should we make that assumption? Why should we not, why should we not, 
wonder if it was Adam in the line of Seth that was building some of this stuff um, that were capable of doing this. The technology, as I said, the knowledge might have been ubiquitous. And there's, you know, there's some, there's some, there are some, let's call them um, notions floating around there, prevalent notions, prevailing notions, let's call them, in regard to certain things that that um, I think need to be corrected. And one of those is that the, um, is that the, <sighs> I just I, I just lost my train of thought. So uh, I was going to address one of these things, and I totally lost it. It's going to you, come to me. In a, in a, you in were a minute talking about so there's, there's fill in the gaps there, here. It's going to come to me. I need to drink more coffee. There's no reason to assume that it was the bad guys making all this stuff. And uh, and, and and I was thinking, yeah, we we get uh, biblically, we get a, a a pretty strong case that God builds pretty awesome cities. And that they're pretty spectacular, and that they can descend and land on the earth at some point. So, so it's not it's yeah. not specifically one side or the other that's able to wield this kind of technology for spectacular results. And if mankind well, was interacting with it, these beings, then who knows what we would have picked up and put to our own uses? That's right. The other thing too is that you know, like Heiser kind of pointed out in um, Unseen Realm and other works related to the fact that. Adam and Eve are wandering around the garden and there's a multitude of elder race brethren there and sister. That's true as well. Right. And so we, this one of those, just like you said, you know, we, we had this assumption that it was only the bad guys. Well, there's also this assumption that the elder race was not walking around on the earth, hanging out with people the entire time before the watchers made their rebellious shift. Because there's nothing to tell us that there wasn't a lot of interaction between the elder race and the children of God on earth in the material realm, in this new creation that he made. And it's like, why? Why are we assuming that? There's nothing that tells point. us that. That's a valid so. point. It came back to me. There's no reason to assume that all of the megaliths are built by giants. That's what I was going to say. But all of those are also very valid points. So I'm kind of glad I forgot my thought. Um and because that is a prevailing assumption, that's one of those prevailing notions that I was that I was going to address. No, there's no way that all the megaliths were built, let's say, by or slash for giants. And if you study megaliths, and I don't mean just looking at pictures of megaliths on on Google Images. I mean if you go or to where these the most impressive megalithic sites are around the world and you walk around them and you walk through them, it will become apparent uh, rather quickly to you in some of these sites, such as the ones in Malta, for example, <clears throat> that the megaliths were not built for giants. They were not built for giants. The doorways are too small, the passageways, the corridors, I have to squeeze through some of them. And I'm only six foot tall. Uh, so it, it's apparent that not all of the we can at least say definitively that not all of the megaliths were made for giants. Now you might you might argue that well they weren't built for giants but they were all built by giants. Um, there's no reason why that has to be the case. I do believe I am convinced that some of the megaliths were built by giants and for giants, and the one site that I always reference when I say this is Saksaiwaman in Cusco, those mammoth megalithic walls of Saksaiwaman. When you go to Saksaiwaman, you find something very interesting. And those of you who've been there will attest to this. The doorways are very large and wide. And this is interesting because this is supposed to be a citadel. And when you build a defensive citadel, you don't want wide, broad doorways that a lot of soldiers can can pour through at once, right? Quite the opposite. It's a dumb idea, right? You want small, narrow doorways and narrow corridors so that the attackers, so that the assailants have to come one by one or two by two, and you can easily resist them. Um, and the, the opposite is the case in in Saksaiwaman. These are very broad doorways. Um, you could you could they seem to be they seem to be designed 
uh, with nine or 10 foot tall people in mind or for the accommodation of nine to 10 foot tall people. Even the stairwells, when you walk through the gigantic doorway, the stairwells leading up to the, to the, um, uh, to the higher levels of the citadel are spaced, are not spaced according to the gait of an average size man. The spacing is, let's say, let's assume that, that, these steps were spaced to accommodate the casual gait of the builder. And that's how we so often will, will build steps so that you take one step to go up, then the next step is up, then the next, or maybe two, you know, maybe two steps and then you're on the next level and two more and you're on the next level. But these, these steps are, are not at all, uh, do not appear to be accommodating the gait of a normal sized man if you were nine or 10 foot tall, it would be perfect. You know, each stride would be, a, would be another level of the step. Um, and so you have clues like this at some of the megalithic sites that this appears to have been built by and for very large people. Indeed, in Sacsayhuaman, the legend of the Quechua people who live there, not the archaeologists, the archaeologists um, will, not, will not condone this view or even mention it. But it's known, and the Quechua people still live there in Cusco, and many of them only speak Quechua. They don't even speak Spanish, so they're very connected to their, to their ancient roots. If you ask them who built the walls of Sacsayhuaman, rather than, rather than reply with the conventional view, which is the Inca, of course. By the way, there's, the Inca never claimed to have built those walls. The Quechua will tell you that they were built by an ancient race of giants. Okay. However, if you get in a car and drive an hour and a half to another megalithic site called Ojantay Tambo, which is just as impressive as Sacsayhuaman. Indeed, I would say that the stonework at Ojantay Tambo, at Ojantay Tambo is even more exquisite than, Oja than Sacsayhuaman. If you walk through that complex, and it is megalithic, the foundations of Ojantay Tambo, the Temple of the Sun, uh, are megalithic. Now, the Inca did occupy Sacsayhuaman, and they, they did occupy Ojantay Tambo, and they did repair and build on top of the original foundations. But if you walk through Ojantay Tambo, you are going to notice that the scale is different than Sacsayhuaman. The doorways are not as wide. The corridors are not as large. The stairwells are not as, uh, are not spaced so extensively. So, um, Obviously, these locations were built for different purposes, but perhaps even for different sized people. And it's why should we think that, you know, it's not one size fits all for, for megaliths. That's that's apparent. That is apparent. Everybody needs to understand that uh, immediately. Everyone needs to understand that it's a not one size. It's all built for giants. Um, that is not the case. There are megaliths, as I've said, that that normal sized human beings have to sort of squeeze through. So we're dealing with something very complex here. What I think we are unquestionably dealing with is a ubiquitous knowledge and technology, uh, a technology that that is known by both the offspring of the watchers and the human species. Now, I would also argue that Although the knowledge might have been ubiquitous, I believe that there was a, a let's say, a degree of technology that was reserved for the offspring of the gods. Because if you recall in the uh, Enochian tale, the watchers, in exchange for, in exchange for the hands of their daughters in marriage, the watchers instructed mankind in the forbidden in forbidden knowledge um which which really equates to technology so right uh that was a bargain and they they got their wives the women who they chose and then they offered uh a particular knowledge set to presumably the fathers of these brides and also the men at large um they gave them, they taught them the knowledge that these men were 
already striving to learn. That's what it says in Enoch. So the human race, the, the, let's say, and I would be specific, I w- and there's reasons, and I put this in the book, in my book, Birthright. I would, I would make this specific to the sons of Cain. We're striving to learn certain technological secrets, certain scientific secrets. They were striving to learn these things. The watchers already knew that they wanted to learn these secrets in order, perhaps in order to develop certain technologies. Um, and so the watchers specifically provided them with the knowledge, with this information that they were already were striving to learn in exchange for their daughter's hands in marriage. That's an important point because there are indications in, in, um, in the book of Enoch that the watchers saved the best and most useful knowledge for their offspring and their wives. In other words, their families. They were building dynasties, and they were, they were reserving this the, the greater knowledge for their dynasties. And so why am I saying that? Because what you would have in the antediluvian world is you would have a level of remarkable knowledge that would be ubiquitous, that everybody would know, like perhaps the knowledge to build megaliths. So you could have giants building megaliths, and you could have regular humans building megaliths because the knowledge was ubiquitous. Um, but then you would have other aspects of of technology and and technological knowledge that was only known to the offspring of the watchers, to the sons of the watchers. Why would they do that? Well, they would do that to ensure the continuity of their family lines, of their, of their, um, of their sons and, and their grandsons and so on, because they were going to govern the earth. And it's very much like, um, it, it very, it's very much like a fraternity, of hybrid beings, the sons of the watchers and their mothers, according to Enoch, who were in <laughs> possession of the greater knowledge, right? So, so you have this tiered system, you would have this tiered society, you would have the gods and the demigods in possession of the greater knowledge and the greater technology, but then you would have some advanced technology also available to the rest of mankind via the transaction, number one, via the transaction between um, this transaction that the watchers made with the sons of Cain, but also, also the knowledge that was already known to Adam and his offspring that was given to them by God, right? And this would see Adam wasn't a gardener. <laughs> this is this is a misconception that that so many Christians are are hamstrung with this weird conception that Adam was a gardener, that Adam was was on his hands and knees, pulling the weeds around his tomato plants. That's not what Adam was do, doing. Adam was a, was the king of planet Earth. That's who Adam Jesus was. Jesus was just a carpenter too, right? <laughs> Symbolically. Yeah. On, on, uh, on, my, was, on my Sunday school felt board. He was the regent of planet Earth. And, and this is a very regal position. Adam and Eve were revered among their offspring. These were kings. And, um, and, and, and they were, again, very, very intelligent, much more so than us, very much more uh, robust, physically robust than we are, probably communicating telepathically, living for hundreds and hundreds of years. For all intents and purposes, they would look like gods compared to us, though they were not. They were members of the divine family. Originally, Adam and Eve were. Um, so they were they were created to with they were created with the biological capabilities to fulfill their function, which wasn't to garden. Okay, their function was akin was analogous to that of their elder siblings, the sons of God. Okay, we're talking about very regal. Our parents, our original parents, were very very regal individuals, and. Um, and so it's it's important to keep that in mind when we look back into the past, into the antediluvian world. We're dealing with a caliber of human being that we can we we can scarcely imagine. Yeah. So I want to take a moment and jump ahead to present day, and you know you talk in your book about uh, kind of the post-human apocalypse that's, that's coming, transhumanism, and you know I think there's some things there's a lot of things in your book where it's even more relevant relevant now than when you first wrote it. Uh, I think things like uh, Neuralink and AI 
uh, that that have I don't, I don't know if they've accelerated even faster than you expected. Uh, but just today, there was a, a video released about the, the first Neuralink um, implant subject, you know, talking about how you can play he's, games now. He's playing games. You know, he, he, he said in the video that he felt like he had telekinesis. Mm -hmm. So you see te technology kind of maybe taking us back to what we originally had. And then I was also thinking about AI and I was on a business call the other day and people were talking about you know, they, they have this whole big report and they just tell AI to read it and give them a summary. And then I was listening to another book today about neuroplasticity and the importance of using our own brains to do that. And I'm thinking, you know, the way we use technology is, you know, the, and you talked about the, the trajectory we're on with our technology. It actually makes us dumber, right? We, we we mm -hmm. we use technology to social media make things so much easier on ourselves and and shorten our attention spans and actually end up making us dumber like literally dumber over time. We are we are doing the opposite of of growing our brains and getting better uh, because of technology. Uh, so is there any of that stuff that you that you see progressing even faster than you than you saw it coming when you wrote the book? Um, not really, not really. Um, I think that it's all progressing pretty much along the timeline that I predicted not to aggrandize myself or to try and sell more copies of my book, but, um, I'm trying to think here, is there anything that's progressed faster than I anticipated? I mean, your, your I knew book did when have I wrote a, the book. It, it there was a lot of urgency. I'm sorry. I was saying there's a lot of urgency in your book. I mean, the, the tone of it is very urgent, and I know tw yeah. 2017 ish seems like a very very long time ago. It wasn't that long ago, but my gosh, a lot has changed since then. But there was a lot of what your your book was was sounding an alarm, saying, "Hey, look look at where we're going." And the yeah. the technological advancement seems to be unfolding at the pace that, that, that I had presumed it would. Um, but, and I would say the same in regard to what I call the alien, the alien presence, the disclosure of the alien presence, because I wrote the book actually in 2020. I published it on Halloween night, actually. And that wasn't intentional. It just happened to be when I had all the, all the uh, files ready for publication. I remember I went to publish and I thought, it's Halloween night. Is this really, I mean, people are going to think that I did this purposely, but um, I went with it anyway. At least um, it wasn't April Fool's. So. <laughs> exactly. So um, the, the unfolding of, of, of this, this strange, slow, bizarre um, disclosure that we're seeing roll out. Uh, really began in 2017. So I, I could look back and see the beginning, right? Um, it, it had already begun. It was already underway when I wrote the book. So I didn't predict that suddenly, you know, the government would be talking about UFOs. It was already underway. I just predicted that it would continue to unfold um, in the manner that it was. And then, of course, in 2017, we had that article that was published in the New York Times that sort of sort of um, set that that sort of what am I trying to say here uh, catalyzed this this rollout of disclosure that we're witnessing today that that got it going it, it was it was the um, it was really the beginning of what we're seeing unfold um, and so I had the advantage of being able to to observe that for a couple of years as I was writing the book um, but I, I guess, you know, that's just a long, long way to say no. I mean, I, I, I think that everything is pretty much on schedule. Um, oh, I will say this. Um, the one thing that seems to be lagging behind, and I had a, a, a couple minutes to think about it there, but the one thing that seems to be lagging behind is the, the new religion. Because in my book, as you know, I've got these, um, I've got these, this diagram that I created of these three concentric circles 
um, that are converging. And I'm flipping through my book here to see if I can grab it really quick, but I, I don't have it bookmarked. But I've got these three consecutive circles that are converging, and these represent the three, um, let's say, the, the, the three primary themes that I see that I see developing simultaneously that when these things come together, it's going to, it's going to bring about a resurrection of the golden age um, and everything that that entails, which I describe in the book. And these three themes are the, I call it the alien threat. I almost said the alien presence, but it's, but I call it the alien threat. Um, the, I don't remember what I called the other one. I think I called it uh, post-humanism. There it is. What did I call that one? Post on the bottom, uh, the post-human paradigm, the alien threat, the post-human paradigm, and then the new religion, which I gold star Dan. I I I, I coined a term um, for this new religion, apotheotheism, and and so yes, having thought about it now and rambling through this, yes, uh, there is something that's that's not on schedule as I thought it would be. And that is the new religion, apotheotheism. I thought that we would see that unfolding a little bit um, quicker, although it is. It is unfolding, but it's not as perceivable as the other two yet. That one is sort of lagging behind, but but that's going to come to the forefront. And in many ways, that's that's not going to really come to the forefront until we have full disclosure, until, until we have uh, the intervention of, let's call them, extraterrestrial saviors. That's how they'll be perceived in my estimation. And that's, by the way, that's the group that the Vatican is preparing for and perhaps even in communication with. Um, these are going to be our, uh, and again, in my estimation, our blonde haired blue eyed saviors who are going to deliver us from the alien threat, which of course is reference to the, the greys and the, the Nordics versus the greys, right? I'm sorry. Nordics versus the greys. Yes. Something to that effect. Yeah. Um, and so that's really when the the new religion of uh is is going to come into full bloom. So I guess I I guess I did kind of expect that one to lag, but that that certainly is is not as apparent as the others, as the as the posthuman paradigm and the alien threat. Um, and the posthuman paradigm encompasses all things transhumanism, Neuralink included, right? So that's clearly moving along on schedule, and there are. Uh, uh, one thing I didn't address, I did address it in the book, but I didn't uh, spend a whole lot of time on it. And if I could go back, and this goes back to our original question here, if I could go back and, and, and amend, not amend, but update the text, I would have spent a little more time talking about artificial intelligence. Um, it is in the book. I do talk about artificial intelligence, but um, the acceleration of artificial intelligence and the way that it's already beginning to transform our, our human society is is really quite uh, astonishing. Anyone who's awesome. in the creative arts, um, graphics design, um, uh, creative writing, or s writing scripts or screenplays, um, even in research and and writing academic papers, artificial intelligence has already changed the game. Already changed the game completely. Um, so. Even in even in regard to making to filmmaking, uh, there are going there are already short films that are com that are completely manufactured, completely fabricated by artificial intelligence from start to finish, including every every shot, every angle, all the music, everything is completely generated by artificial intelligence. So uh, I knew that we would see the unfolding of of of. Um, of artificial intelligence, uh, but I didn't, I don't think I realized how quickly that was going to get going after I, I published uh, the book. Can, well, can the we other thing, back? like they even had a couple of um, commercials that were put out by actors who had to disavow the commercial, like Tom Hanks selling products on late night TV. And the entire thing was deep faked. That's right. And AI generated his voice and generated his, his mannerisms and it looked like him and it talked like him. And he's coming out saying, no, 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 that wasn't me. I don't have a relationship with this company. I'm not selling this product. Um, but of course, the bad guys are always going to try to use this stuff for hacking and whatnot. But mm -hmm. 
Tim, if, if you don't mind going back to, to something that, that you brought up earlier about this disclosure of the alien uh, you know, quote unquote threat, which is a, a it, which is very deliberately being positioned that way. And I think what we're seeing for those of us who have been paying attention to this disclosure type process that had that turning point in 2017 is we're seeing something of a very curated narrative. And and you've speculated that it's building to a, uh, a, a manufactured conflict that sets us up for accepting a certain narrative. But I I'm want to recognize that 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 situation is not very congruent with the whole conversation we just had in terms of what uh, ancient history might have looked like. So in, in other words, the the curated narrative that we're getting around the extraterrestrial scenario is exactly that. It's curated, it's manipulated, and it's not accurate. Where would you say we need to be paying attention to what's being told to us about the alien threat and how it's being positioned and how it's being very carefully laid out according to certain expectations and and probably with you know some level of permission and manipulation of what we're seeing versus the reality that goes back to 10,000 BC or and probably way before that we are being told the truth and lied to simultaneously because there's a factional conflict underway and this is uh, something that um, my colleague, colleague Richard Dolan, and I discuss quite often. Mm-hmm. Is that it's it's apparent that there's a there's a factional conflict within uh, the United States government, within the deep state, in regard to disclosure of the alien presence. There's the the secrecy group who wants to keep a lid on everything, who don't believe that the American public has the right to know anything, or American presidents for that matter. And then there is the disclosure group, we can call them, um, or a group that wants, that is advocating for some level of disclosure, maybe not full disclosure, but some level of disclosure. And that group wants to be more forthright with the American people and wants to disclose aspects of the phenomenon. And that's why we're seeing sort of this ping pong situation where you have guys like David Grush come forward and then you have uh, high ranking members of the intelligence community coming and um, and affirming Grush, um, if not publicly, at least to members of Congress. And then you have on the other side of that equation, you have Arrow, you know, the Pentagon's official uh, UAP investigative body that just released a report saying, no, it's just all. It, it it's it's all of this UFO stuff is is really just the product of a UFO religion, and and it's it's confusion with legitimate um, special access programs where we're developing you know high tech um, high tech air, aircraft or weaponry and and so you have these dueling narratives. Um, there are members in the intelligence community who are leaking things purposely because they, they're they part of the pro-disclosure faction. And then there are members in the intelligence community who are working to suppress and subvert those efforts because they are part of the, the secrecy group. Um, and so that's why we're seeing these dual narratives. And um, I would say that one side isn't necessarily winning out over the other right now. Um, but uh, it's really hard to put. It's it's really hard to put the, you know, the old adage to put the toothpaste back into the into the tube at this point, uh, as it pertains to the disclosure of the alien presence, which I think is apparent at this point. Most Americans are convinced. At least half. I think it's actually more than half of Americans are convinced at this point that uh, that extraterrestrials are real. That UFOs represent. Uh, a non-human faction, at least a non-human phenomenon, at least some of them, and that the government knows about it and is covering it up. I, I would say that, and I think I've seen polls to this effect, that that if it's not 50% of the American population, or, or over 50%, it might even be 60 at this point, it's certainly, it's certainly going to be soon. So um, it, there's this, there's this um, continual narrative that I'm encountering 
all over the internet, on social media. I'm going to encounter it in the comments of this video. That all of this is just deception. It's all just getting us ready for Project Bluebeam. And for those who are unaware, Project Bluebeam is um, a fake alien invasion, a contrived alien invasion in which we use sophisticated holographic technology or our own advanced aerospace craft to um, to feign an alien invasion uh, in order to exert control over the population, the populace, or whatever, whatever, um, whatever that might be useful for by the bad guys. Um, and that's, that hypothesis is becoming increasingly tenuous and difficult to maintain be, because of, because of this obvious, um, factional war we're seeing in the intelligence community at the Pentagon. And I think even within the aerospace contracting companies, the defense aerospace contracting companies themselves who are, who are hands on the technology. Um, clearly there's a battle raging here behind the scenes. And also clearly we're dealing with nuts and bolts technology that if you, if you, take the time to go back in time and research the old school ufological data, um, which I think is, is in, in some ways, um, much more reliable than, than, than the, than the, the research being conducted today in the realm of ufology. Um, it's almost impossible to conclude. I don't think it's logically feasible to conclude that this technology is non-human that much, some, let's say some of what we see in regard to these advanced aerospace vehicles, what I've seen personally, what so many others have seen, uh, is not derived from human technology, from human knowledge, that it is, it is non-human in origin. And, and again, as I said, that's becoming more and more apparent. Uh, the, the Aero report is just an attempt to, um, to discredit the members of Congress who are trying to pry the lid on this thing, pry the lid off this thing, and this thing being uh, disclosure of the reverse engineering programs and the the alien bodies and and so forth, and 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 these guys are engaged in a valiant effort. I mean, if you think that these guys in Congress, the, the core group of guys in Congress who are working uh, to to, who are attempting to get information and access to some of to some of these, or at least to verify some of these claims being made by the whistleblowers, such as Fravor and and Grush and some of the other guys, even guys like Bob Lazar, who blew the whistle back in the early '90s. If you think that those guys are doing this just just for show, or that they're doing it for some sort of a deception, it's it's very simple. You haven't met them. You haven't talked to them. I have. And these well, are very and, sincere men. These are very sincere men. And the core group of these guys happen to be Christians, happen to be believers, and and guys and gals. And they are are men and women of integrity. And um, and this is not, they're not working towards some kind of a Project Blue Book thing. Uh, no. Um, they think that there that the government very likely does have reverse engineered non-human craft nuts and bolts nuts and bolts we're not talking about some kind of you know phantom technology that just disappears that pretends to be physical no no no, no. that's ridiculous we we have the craft okay we have it and um and there's you know this is a whole another conversation but we have the craft there's ample evidence out there to conclude um, unequivocally, that the alien presence is real, it's physical, that their technology is, is real and can be to some degree reverse engineered, to some degree. We have a problem with the reverse engineering because much of it relies on exotic materials, materials that are not produced on planet Earth, um, elements and isotopes that are simply unavailable to us, that you can only harvest in outer space or on another planet or on the moon, right? So, um, 
that right there is definitive evidence of an extraterrestrial presence, by the way, not just an extra dimensional. Now, is there an extra dimensional component here? Sure. I'm totally open to that. And I do think there is, but, but, but at the very least we're dealing with some extraterrestrial technology because the technology depends on, uh, depends on exotic matter. Well, and, and now and we've got a lot more public, um, announcements from companies like SpaceX and others about, plans to go and harvest materials from outside of the planet and it's like okay that's right well, kind of dovetails together over time there's no the, the extra dimensional piece the, there's no requirement that extra dimensional means non-physical extra dimensional could mean extra physical in, in some ways and, and for people who are listening who want to come up to speed on some of the nuts and bolts stuff that that uh Tim Alberino is talking about here. Richard Dolan is deaf since he came up earlier, and I know he's a friend of yours. Uh, he's w by far one of the most excellent researchers out there in terms of the, the the lengthy work he's done and the amount of database material that that he's compiled, and the very careful academic approach he's taken to getting the entire spectrum of this topic just from a. Uh, from a research perspective, I, I want to, and I know you, you've been very generous with your time. So if, if you're okay with one more question, then sure. uh, I'd, I'd like a, a little more speculation because I, I, I want to keep trying to reconcile the uh, where we started versus where we are now. And what I'm trying to connect for our listeners is these things are not exclusive of each other. And you, you talked about these dueling factions in the state. You didn't use a phrase of yours that, that I like a lot, which is the dumb state. And um, part of what I like about the, the dumb state, the, meaning the deep underground military base dumb state, is a, the, the name of this podcast is a, a little bit of an homage to uh, uh, Bill Cooper from the original uh, Mystery Babylon um, broadcast before podcasts were a thing. And, and he did Behold a Pale Horse, where he talked a great deal about this idea of the dumb state when nobody was talking about it. And uh, it's also it, a double it, entendre. It is. Yes. Yes, it is. Uh, we like plays on words here. Um, that's hence, hence mystery Bible on, you know, so, um, so we, when you think about the, the dumb state, feel free to speculate, but how, how much of that people think, okay, well, if it's, if it's government and it's underground and it's technological, this is all just nuts and bolts, but what about the occultic undertones on that side? Because you talked about these dueling factions. You said, look, there are people on this side that are believers, that are sincere, that are trying to raise an alarm about something that they think is, is some level of threat, presumably on a lot of different levels. So when we think about the dumb state, and if there's some amount of crossover between uh, increasing overlap between human technology and non-human technology, where's that interface happening? And how much of that is just straight up occultic, demonic activity? In other words, do our listeners and people who are who are viewing this, I got to say viewers now, I'm not used to that. Are, do our viewers need to start rethinking what they think demonic activity is and how it's being employed to very practical ends? The interfacing is happening with both with the technology and the entities is happening to a large extent in the deep underground military bases, in the dumps. Um, there are locations all around the United States that are that are secret military installations in which these special access programs are being developed. Um, and that's one of the revelations that came out, by the way, with David Grush. He actually had the coordinates, claimed to have the coordinates to some of these uh, locations. Um, so that's where the interfacing is happening. I do believe there, there, there may even be cooperation at this point in the development of some of this technology, cooperation by the, the non-human entities. And that cooperation is not just information that's being received in a seance, let's say, or something like that. No, I'm talking about alien greys working side by side, side with human scientists. Now, there's no, of course, there's no, there's no definitive proof of this, but there's a lot of um, testimony. There's a lot of uh, circumstantial evidence that would suggest that that's the case. And the best ufologists that I know, uh, that I've spoken to about this, agree that that this is likely true, or that they believe that there's a high degree of likelihood that this is happening. Um, so there is interfacing 
and that's and that's an important point because I think um, a lot of people assume that the interfacing between human and non-human beings is strictly through the occult because they cannot grapple with the idea of a physical being um, of an of, of an alien physical being um, in the equation here it has to be some for some reason people need it to be a some sort of a supernatural phenomena or some sort of a spiritual entity um, uh, and that's probably because their their paradigms don't allow for anything else um, so uh, there is interfacing and the technology um, the, again as I said earlier the technologies that we are attempting to reverse engineer are we're running into many difficulties here precisely because the components are of extraterrestrial origin now how would you ever how would you ever be able to conclude that the components are of extra dimensional origin they see this is where you start to get into some strange territory um we don't even know what another dimension looks like for example um, I am, I subscribe to hyperspace theory. Hyperspace theory posits that our physical universe, the one that we inhabit, the one that we're sitting in right now, is comprised of more than the three di spatial dimensions and the one of time. You know, if you, uh, uh, there are, there are different theories out there that incorporate hyperspace, the hyperspace hypothesis, um, one of them, one of the most notable is string theory, which posits that there are at least 10 spatial dimensions that make up the fabric of our physical world. Not that it's, it's not these five are physical and these five are spiritual. That doesn't make, mean anything. That doesn't make any sense. There are 10, at least in according to string theory, there are at least 10 or super string theory. There are at least 10 spatial dimensions now most of them are so small that they're they're not useful to us in, in regard to doing anything useful in them um, but the point is that these are physical dimensions within the fabric of the universe these are not extra dimensional in the sense that it's a different world see this is there's a conflation of terms here that I'm always trying to address in, in part of our misconception, it's not really our fault. It's 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 the entertainment industry. We we have been thoroughly confused by by the Marvel movies, for example, as it pertains to the multiverse and extra dimensions in hyperspace. Hyperspace. Let's let's talk about hyperspace for a minute. There is a a good scientific representation of hyperspace out there in Star War in in Star Wars. Now, Star Wars incorporates, I think, accurately the concept of hyperspace. When these when the ships enter into hyperspace, they access a lane in uh, a, another spatial dimension within our universe that allows them to travel uninhibited and at greater speed and it and and it basically creates a shortcut and there's there's you can look this up um that star wars was actually very accurate in their depiction of hyperspace so that's the sort of thing i subscribe to but then you take um then you take the marvel movies and you start dealing with the multiverse and extra dimensions so extra dimensional um so extra dimensional worlds or alternative universe or, or the alternative universe theory gets conflated with um, with the multiverse and with hyperspace. Those three distinct scientific uh, theories are all compressed together. They're all they're amalgamated inside of the, the, these movies that we watch, and so we're all walking around with these concepts in our head that do not actually reflect the, the, the scientific uh, theories. And in fact, these are separate, these are separate ideas. So for instance, um, 
I don't, I don't believe at all that, that we live in a multiverse. I think it's absolute, it's ludicrous. I think frankly, it's stupid. This notion of a multiverse, that's, that's ridiculous. Um, uh, if we, if we were, were standing, if we were all standing together, let's say in my backyard and we're looking up at the sky and in broad daylight, we see a portal open. We see some, something happen in the sky let's say a a a hole in the atmosphere forms and it's this opening and all around the edges of this opening is our sky that we're looking at the clouds and, and our normal sky but inside of this opening of this essentially this hole that's penetrating through our sky we see a different sky we see a different atmosphere what does that mean what does that mean? What are we looking at if that's the case? It would be it would be illogical to assume that we're looking to another dimension. That would not be the logical conclusion here. The logical conclusion would be that we're looking at a different part of our universe or a different planet or indeed a different part of the earth. Because we're seeing so, an atmosphere. So the we're question clouds. is why are they trying to program people? to think different dimension first before no this is a lane to another celestial body in our own universe that we you know you don't do you understand what i'm saying why yeah. why are they trying to conflate these ideas together and make us think extra dimensionality sure. as opposed to the multiple well it's it, the words that the words suck because it's the same amount it's it's multi-dimensionality within our universe if there's 10 dimensions but extra dimensional in that multiversal usage doesn't mean the same thing as as string theory does for dimensions. It I'm means not sure a separate universe. I'm not sure it's intentional. I think it's easy okay. for right for, for bad writers. Yeah. You okay, think I multiverse, got you. what do you what do you call it? It's a MacGuffin, I think is what it's called. Yeah, and, MacGuffin, uh, that's right. It's it's easy. It's so easy. It's 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 so convenient. Nobody really understands it. The public doesn't really understand it. So, so it, you don't have to be accurate, scientifically accurate. It's just such an easy narrative device to fall back on. Um, extra dimensional, you know, multiverse. It's like, uh, and but nobody really understands what that means. So, how would you differentiate? So, we're looking up at that at that hole in the sky, and we're seeing another atmosphere, and 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 suddenly three saucers come out of it. This is, by the way. A real story from a friend of mine three saucers come flying out of it but you're looking at a different atmosphere how would you how would you differentiate a a different part of our universe or our planet from a from an from another dimension how would you ever differentiate that i don't how, think how you, you could what would the difference be so yeah, what is the difference could. in the physics or the reality of an interdimensional world as opposed to ours what's the difference what well, is the if, difference? If the saucers arrive, and if they are real physical things, then in, in the immortal words of Hillary Clinton, what difference at this point does it make? Precisely. Because, because the point is, <laughs> well, they're here, and whether they came from, whether I understand where they came from or don't understand where they came from, they're here. And what you're describing, too, by the way, sounds an awful lot like like Stephen in front of the council on, you know, looking up and seeing, That's uh, right. seeing heaven. And that's, right. and, and that's not a different, you know, that you, there's, I, I know you don't like the word supernatural and I don't either. It's not like, oh, well, well, that's spiritual. And what your friend saw is something. No, it's, it's the same thing. And the fact that we don't understand how it works doesn't mean it's not real and valid and legitimate in our reality, even if our reality is a subset of a, of a larger reality. Yeah. And, and even, if, even if it is interdimensional, it's still part of the fabric of our universe. Yeah, because this separate. is where people conflate alternative universe theories or alternative world theories. So an alternative world or, or, or an alternative universe, which is a little bit different from multiverse, that is a world entirely distinct from ours. Like it doesn't have the same physics. It, it doesn't. Nothing should be very much very similar to our world. This is a world that does not exist within our universe. OK, this is a world that's in a different universe one that we can't even comprehend. This would be akin to Narnia, although there's some, you could make the argument that Narnia is another planet, which C.S. Lewis kind of does, actually. Yeah, um, he does. 
well, the war, the, war, the wood between the worlds, right? Where did the, where did the, That's by right. the way, where did the white witch come from? Mm. She, she came, came from, from Charn, which is, she came from like Charn. Mars, she came from another world, Mars, actually. So, yes. And I'm not saying that that's that a fiction, of course, but I think in Lewis's brain, that was Mars. She came from Mars. I think there's yeah, a very the, interesting. C.S. Lewis knew something. I mean, we, we've concluded that again and again. Like this guy, he knew something. There, he yeah. was on. Well, something. he was thinking on a level, I think, that was. Um, he was thinking in ways that would not have made him very popular in mainstream Christian society hmm. uh, were he to voice them frankly. And so he sort of cloaked these ideas in the fiction, in the fictional narratives that he wrote. But yes, I think he was thinking about a lot of this. Um, and, and, and I would also say Tolkien was, and, and that shouldn't be surprising because they were, you know, they were part of the, the inklings and they'd sit around and probably talk about these very kinds of things. So, um, so the point is you see a, portal open you're looking on the other side there's a different atmosphere there's and by the way these craft these saucers are flying through one atmosphere into another they're not just blinking into the into they're not just sort of suddenly supernaturally appearing right they're flying they're traversing from one atmosphere to another so there's a physical and it's not continuity that the craft between is interdimensional on that side of the portal and physical on this one that's not what's happening. It's it's the same craft operating on the same physics on that side of the portal as it is on this side. And I'm referencing in my mind a particular incident, by the way, and actually a set of incidences. Um, so so do, am I opposed to the interdimensional hypothesis? No. I just don't understand why people axiomatically reject the inter the extra dimensional hypothesis, which is logical and you can take a telescope and of course the flat earthers will object but you can take a telescope and look up and see mars and jupiter and you can see you can see saturn and the rings of saturn and you can see the moons orbiting around these various planets i've seen all of this through a high powered telescope um and they look just like they look in the books by the way um and and you can see those planets and there they are every night. You can walk outside your house without a telescope and see them, see them gloss and shimmer in the night sky. You don't have to like twist your brain into a pretzel to, to figure out how they might exist. They're right there. They're right there. And so it's like the easiest explanation for craft that can operate so effortlessly in our atmosphere and out of our atmosphere in outer space. By the way, keep in mind, everybody, that UFOs have been observed operating outside of the atmosphere of planet earth <laughs> in other words out right. there where our satellites and 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 the space station and, and and the other artifacts we have out in space are orbiting the earth they're out there flying around just as effortlessly as they're flying effortlessly as they're flying around down here so if you have these craft that can fly around in the outer atmosphere of planet earth or or outside of the atmosphere of planet earth in orbit let's say then, then how big of a of a logical leap is it to assume that they're doing the same thing in the atmosphere of Mars and around the atmosphere uh, or in the outer space around Mars? I mean, it's not a big jump. Uh, this is <laughs> this is this would not be difficult for somebody in the possession of this kind of technology that performs these kinds of technological feats to operate to be able to traverse our our solar system and 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 enter into a base let's say on mars i mean it's it just seems so strange that people want to gravitate to an extra dim dimensional hypothesis where you you don't even have you don't even have enough pieces of the puzzle to even make sense of that because we simply do not understand an extra spatial dimension. How do I know we don't understand it? Because our brains cannot conceptualize it. It's impossible. Our brains cannot conceptualize a world that's con that is comprised of more than three dimensions. It's literally impossible. You cannot imagine what a hypercube looks like, a tesseract. You can't do it. 
it's literally impossible. But here we are so confidently hypothesizing about an extra dimensional world and extra dimensional beings when you can't even imagine what a freaking hypercube looks like. Mm-hmm. And, it, and I'm not saying that doesn't exist, the extra dimensional world. I'm just saying it's like the Marvel movies. It's a, what do we call it, a MacGuffin? Yep, it's like that's a, right. It's like a MacGuffin for Christians to to just to just default to extra dimensional, extra dimensional, extra dimensional, extra dimensional, and I'm saying, okay, I'm I got it, I understand that's on the table, but don't don't ignore the most obvious and logical conclusion yeah. here, yeah. okay? Yeah. It's unnecessary. We we don't need seven more dimensions to explain the the basics of what no. we're How seeing here. How many Christians but- do you have to talk to that spiritualize? the elder race and you have to point out all the places in the old testament even without going to the dead sea scrolls where they physically interacted with everyone yeah there's a lot of christians that tend to think that it's just all spiritual and it's like why do you think that the bible doesn't say that the bible says that they're physical well they get here and they interact with us even some of my favorite uh scholars will say that angels they assume a human form. Yeah, I heard, I've heard that it, too. And it's like, assume a human form. And I'm like, why would you put the word assume there? Right. So, because so you have to accept all of the ridiculous things. If you're going to make that claim, then you need to be, you need to own all of the ridiculous things that follow from that statement. So you're saying that angels assume a human, what does that even mean? Like, we're talking about genies. So they assume a physical form. And presumably with all of the organs, I mean, they're this physical form. Is it stuffed with intestines? Do they got all the cells and everything, all the little mechanisms working in that physical form that they just well, they, pop they out eat? Of they better they better have something in there because they exactly eat. Exactly right, because they're eating and they're like they're drinking. Where does the liquid go? When they when they when when they sup with Abraham, where does the liquid go that they drink? Does it just does it go into another dimension? <laughs> Does it just disappear? There's a dimensional bathroom. Multiverse. That was handy. Right. Yeah. So I, I'm always just like looking at this, like thinking to myself, where do we get these illogical notions? Why don't we just draw the most obvious conclusions? Why don't we draw the most obvious conclusions? And and the answer is largely because we are still bootstrapped with medieval theology and a medieval worldview, a worldview that was largely constructed during the Dark Ages. And we think for some reason that this is the correct, accurate view and that we must adopt it. And but I don't accept it any more than I believe that foul air is the cause of most diseases. Uh, We know that's not the case anymore. So we can jettison so many of these dumb medieval ideas as it pertains to our everyday life, right? Evil I mean, humors. We don't believe witches fly around on broomsticks. Um, and, and, you know, these kinds of things come out of the medieval age and, uh, and out of the dark ages, rather. And, and yet we hold on to all the medieval thinking as it pertains to the Bible. It doesn't make any sense to me. You know, we live in the 21st century. We are modern thinkers. We are, we are allowed, indeed entitled, to apply our 21st century brains to what we're reading in the Bible. There's no prohibition of doing that. And so why would I not do that? Um, and so that's why I'm always looking for an, an explanation that is rational um, rather than, quote unquote, supernatural. Now, Do I believe in the supernatural or rather more specifically, do I believe that there is a, that there are supernatural beings or more specifically, do I believe that there is a supernatural being? The answer is yes. God, God is supernatural. He is above and beyond nature, indeed outside of it. He is outside. He must be, he must be outside of creation. He could not have created it unless he was outside of it. So does does Timothy Albrino believe in the supernatural? Yes, I believe in one supernatural being. Right. Because everything and, and, else and by he created way, by God. definition is natural. I'm sorry? Right. Everything else he created by definition 
in this universe is natural. Yes, it's it's all abides by the laws of physics that he put into place. Yeah, even okay. his son is within creation. See, we inter we can know the Father. How do we know the Father? There's only one way through that the son. anyone can know the Father, and that is through the Son. No man has ever seen the Father at any time, right? Jesus said. So Jesus is the likeness. Jesus is the image of the Father. The only way that you could even ever begin to know the Father is through his Son, who is inside of creation. The Father is outside of creation. The only way you can know him is through his Son. It's the only way. So, and, it's, and this is very elegant, really, when you think about it, because people say, well, there's so many different religions out there. It's like a buffet, and you can choose... You know, it's all the, all these different paths lead to God idea. You can choose Buddha, or you can choose Jesus, or you can you can choose Muhammad. You know, all of these things are similar. Well, no, that's not true because there's something very elegant about the biblical narrative, and 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 it is that there's only one path to God because there's literally only one way you can know Him, and that is through His express image. That's it, and the only express image is. Jesus. Jesus is his likeness, his express image. Creation itself knows the Father through the Son, period. And people say, well, we can know God through what he's created. Yes, we can. And through whom did he create everything? Through the Son. Clearly. Mm. That'll preach. Colossians 115. All things were created by him and through him and for him and in him all things consist so it's this really elegant um it's this really elegant theological exposition that is rarely discussed this notion that there is this singular supernatural being who is outside of space and time, but he has a representative, indeed his only begotten son, who is inside of creation. And, and we can know this unknowable being through his son. And it's, it's very elegant. And, um, and so anyway, that's my little dissertation on supernatural so do do i believe in the supernatural yes one supernatural being and that is god he's that a singular <laughs> and that's that colossians 120 where christ reconciles the natural to the supernatural he reconciles all creation back to himself and i i I think that's a uh, the the, the, practic the practicality of that the 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 reality the elegant reality that you just described is a perfect example of what we're what we're trying to do with this podcast and with these conversations and by bringing material like birthright to light not that it was in the dark before but to light in our own minds and our audience's minds is that you don't have to it doesn't make any sense to separate what we're reading in scripture from the reality of our lives that it's it's it, it's written to us and it applies to us 100 percent it's not this this other hat that we have to put on when we go read that first chapter of Colossians about Christ and who he is and what he's done and how he interacts with reality and the kinds of things he says about himself. We we don't have to take our our reason out in order to look at that and say, I believe that because it's it's describing concepts that we've been so blinded to. But the more we look at the the things that are going on around us in ancient past and and now and in probably the near future. We realize that Christ is necessary. He's absolutely necessary, and none of this makes any sense without him. And that's why that uh, that's you know that statement that you make: there are no atheists in the in the end times because it, 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 you can't you can't conceive of a reality where there's not a reconciliation between natural and supernatural. And then you know we were saying C.S. Lewis knew some things. Well, Paul knew some things. And he's he's yelling them at us through scripture as loudly as he can and repeating them and trying to make them as clear as he can. But they're they're hard concepts if if nobody takes the time to sit down and reflect on them as as we've done this evening. And I would I would add uh, as footnote to what I just said that um, Jesus, the Son of God, is also a supernatural being because he was with the Father from the beginning. 
So, but the difference is the Son of God is inside of creation, very clearly. He is inside of creation. And so, and he's, it's he who shows us the Father. That's clear. He says so. So, um, I, I have this, uh, I have this, uh, term that I use for the Son of God in my book, and and it's it's really quite a loaded term, and I'm not sure if people really understand what I'm what I mean when I use it. I refer to the Son of God as the singularity. As mm. that is my that is how I think of him. He is the singularity, both in his uniqueness among all the other sons of God, right? The only begotten of the Father, but also, also in the cosmological sense. See, the initial sing singularity is the is the initiation of the Big Bang. Well, that's the Son of God in the Scriptures. So uh, this is, um, um, I don't know how I, I got it. Oh, because of the term supernatural. I wanted to clarify that. So I believe that everything is inside of our universe. I do not believe there are other universes that we are, that are, you know, like, that are separated us by some kind of separated from us by some kind of a veil. I don't believe in that. I don't think there are other universes. I do believe that there are more than three spatial dimensions to our universe. That's hyperspace. I do believe in that. Uh, I do not believe in alternative world theory. That there is, you know, adjacent to our reality, a completely different world. I don't believe that either. Rather, I subscribe to what Paul says that we see through a mirror dimly and and what what i've understood that to mean is and and what it really does mean practically speaking is we have cataracts so think about seeing through a mirror dimly you're looking through a dim dirty mirror or 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 window or glass right uh or we see through a glass as it's as it's uh uh sometimes translated dimly well, this is precisely the condition of cataracts. People who have cataracts have this film over their eyes. They can still kind of see the world, but they see these abstract shapes, right? They see the world dimly. And, and this is our condition because of the fall, because of, of, of what precipitated in Eden. And uh, of, of, of what precipitated from Eden, Eden rather, so if those, the cataracts, which is, by the way, is going to be taken away from our eyes, um, the, in the New Testament, it says that we will see him, meaning Christ, as he is. We will, see, we will see everything the way that Adam saw the totality of creation. We will perceive the totality of creation. So it's not, in my opinion, that there are other universes. Rather, there are facets of our universe which are simply imperceivable to us, like infrared, for example. There are spectrums of wave and sound that are, um, that are imperceivable to us, but I think that much of this imperceivable reality around us is going to become perceivable to us at the resurrection when we're reset to the blueprint of Adam through Christ. That, that so, verse that you quoted or that you referenced when we see him as he is, that's first John three. And it, it says, not only will we see him as he is, it says we will be like him because we will see we will him like as he him. is. And how was, and, and being like Christ, of course, we know what Christ is like because we see, we have examples of the, of the, of Jesus interacting with his disciples after he was resurrected. And he does all the things we do, right? He's sitting there on the beach post-resurrection, sitting with his body, by the way. It wasn't like there was a new body. It was his body resurrected. So what's going to happen to us? Our body resurrected. Our body yeah. refashioned, but it's our body. So much so that Jesus had the marks of the crucifixion. Right. So Thomas had to touch the marks of the crucifixion, the, the, the piercing, the, the scar in his side to, to be convinced that this was in fact Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified and buried and rose again. And so um, this is a very good, a very good um, example of what I'm talking about. Is Jesus presently a spiritual being? 
Yes. Is he presently a physical being? Yes. But so are we right now. We are spiritual right. beings in physical bodies. And it's not that it's not that the physical body is bad. That's that's a that's that's actually a, 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 a heresy. This notion that the physical world, material world, is evil. the The reality is, is that we were created to be a composite of spiritual and physical, and those two things are not. It's not that they're not supposed to exist separately from one another. It's two sides of the same coin. And I would say that that is the same condition that the that the elder race is in, that the angels are in. They are composites, just like we are, although they are of a higher nature. Their biology is even more remarkable than ours, whatever that means. But they're not genies. They're not genies. Um, and, and so I don't know if I'm conveying how well I'm conveying this, but we live in one universe, the totality of which we cannot perceive. But it is one universe, one singular universe. Right. Just like our spiritual and our physical bodies inhabit the same, like uh, we're both beings. Our spiritual bodies are not members of another dimensional universal place. They're here with us, just like everything else. And it also makes sense why the enemies of Christ, the enemies of God, thought they could get away with what they did. And they thought when they crucified him that they won because they thought that since God was outside, the father was outside of all of this, that, you know, they could just kind of run roughshod over everything and didn't realize the truth of what God had done with the incarnation. But like you said, one spiritual being and then the physical creation that he's given us. And there are spiritual aspects and physical aspects, but they're all in this space, not other spaces, not spaces that we, like you said before, we can't really conceive of. We pretend we can conceive of them, and we can write stories and have movies, but we're not really understanding anything about that. And it's kind of kind of silly that people, you know, we entertain it in a way that we try to we try to believe like it's real. Right. I guess. And I would certainly differentiate between supernatural and spiritual. Spiritual is a biblical term. Supernatural is not. Spiritual is a biblical reality. What we conceive of as supernatural is better defined as magic, magical, and fanciful. So, and that's not to say that people say, well, didn't Jesus do miracles and stuff? Of course I believe in all of that. And that that doesn't um, um, contradict what I'm saying at all. And because, by the way, number one, Jesus is the architect. He's there building. He's wisdom in the book of Proverbs. He's there. He's, he's in the beginning. He's the architect. He's working Creation is being the father is, has, was pleased to create everything through him and by him and for him. That's the Christocentric perspective. And so, and so, you know, it, it, it is, it is, um, one would expect having this understanding of the son of God, that he would be able to do things that we couldn't do because and he doesn't, it doesn't require magic because it, because he's what he, what he's doing with the miracles is he's he's demonstrating the validity of who he is by exactly. the authority he has to interact with the creation that he has made and that he can he can work in that creation in ways that those with lesser authority can't but when they do that in his name then they can or they Through can the do similar things. That's right. Exactly. So it's 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 the opposite of magic. It's it's working very much within the rules of creation, so long as you're working Precisely. within the, the proper authorities, and do and uh, and the creation is responding to its creator and those authorities. That there's no magic necessary. Right. And so I think that and so I think that what a lot of people this is going further down this path than I intended, but I think that what a lot of people a lot of people conflate supernaturalism with superstition and and again and i think that this this we have a many christians tend to have a superstitious perspective that is the residue of the dark ages they assume that this perspective comes from uh established fact let's say when in reality this perception that they have is is more akin to superstition than it is to reality. And there's there's you know we could go on talking about this for hours. And 
and and and I don't you know I don't want to put out the wrong impression. Um, I absolutely believe in the spirit of God and and in miracles and all of that. That's not what I'm saying. And there's a clarification of this in my book Birthright. Um, and I don't even remember how we went down this path, but oh, the extra dimensional stuff. I think is what kind of led me to these thoughts, but it happens um, so to us all the time. To, to summarize, I do believe I do believe that that there is a possibility of an extra dimensional reality, um, whatever that means, whatever that looks like. I do fully subscribe to a hyperspatial hypothesis. So I'm I'm fully subscribed to the hyperspatial hypothesis. I'm open to an extra dimensional hypothesis. I reject the multiverse hypothesis and the alternative world or the uh, the alternative universe hypothesis. I reject those. We live in one a singular universe, and everything in that universe is bound together by synergistic forces, whether seen or unseen. And I think that is the biblical view, by the way. And so this notion that there are other universes, I think is 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 I think for one thing, it's it's ridiculous. I don't I don't I don't believe that there's a lot of scientific validation for that. It's a realm of pure speculation, whereas hyperspatial um the hyperspatial hypothesis is standing on pretty firm ground um at this point. Well, and, and hyperspace is very simply is just saying that there's a way of moving about our reality that we don't understand yet. That, that's there are extra there are extra spatial there are extra extra spatial dimensions built into the fabric of our universe. An extra dimensional world would be a world outside of our universe. Yeah. It's a layer of the same onion, not a different onion. Yeah, it's parallel yeah. universes. But there, but yeah. there may be an an extra dimensional being who who has facets of their, let's say, biology, are the product of existing in a higher dimensional plane within our universe. That would be an extra dimensional being, and it all gets conflated. It's all kind of conflated together. So I'm open to that. I'm open to that reality. Um, but I'm not open to that being coming from a different universe. That makes sense. That's what I reject, both on biblical and scientific, um, for biblical and scientific reasons. Um, and of course, there are lots of scientists, there are lots of astrophysicists, um, theoretical physicists who subscribe to the uh, multiverse. So it's not like that's an unpopular theory. I just think it's, I just, frankly, I think it's absurd. And there are lots of scientists, lots of astrophysicists and theoretical physicists who think, who think it's absurd, this notion of a multiverse. So it's important for people to parse those, to start to parse those ideas in their minds. And, um, and it's very confusing because they're so similar and the, and the, the, the delineation between them is so, is so intricate that it's, it's easy to cross over. But be aware of that, everyone. Be aware of the fact that when we talk about interdimensional this or that, um, we're likely conflating theories. Well, and there's a lot of mixed definitions across the board. So I think that's a very helpful conversation well. because we, as we speak about these things, it's helpful for people to know what we're talking about, what we're not talking about, that when we talk about dimensional movement, we're not talking about separate or alternative realities. We're just talking about things we don't understand about the reality we live in. And the fact that we don't understand them or can't see them doesn't mean that they're not real and doesn't mean that they belong to something foreign. It, it just means that- Or another universe, that they, yeah, that they come from a different universe or an adjacent world. This is right. this is this is a very popular conception, I think, um, not just in in w among Christians, but probably among um, religions of all stripes. That there is this adjacent world. There's a world that's adjacent to ours, a reality that's right next to ours, but that's we can't access it. There's like a veil. It's a common term that's used. The, the veil. There's a veil separating our reality from theirs, and that would be more akin to like a different universe. And and you and it's right there. It's right on top of our universe. It's happening at the same time, but um, they're distinct universes that are sort of parallel. Um, that to me is 
is very difficult. It's, it's very difficult for me to conceive of that. Um, rather, and this will be the final thing I say on this, because it's such a confusing and complex subject. It, it takes a lot of talking through it, even to make sense of it in my own mind. Rather than that, the idea is rather than there being like a veil separating my world from this world, rather I have cataracts, perceptual cataracts. It's not that it's a different world. It's just a different facet of my world. Yeah. That I can't but, see. To put which it is in, a in, That's- in biblical terms, we think that the Bible talks frequently of heaven, earth, and under the earth. They're not three separate realities. They happen to be physically adjacent, but it also says that Christ is recognized as Lord of all of those, and He's not the King. It, it's it's not it's not three different uh, three different realities. He's the King of it's one reality. We happen to be particularly native to one aspect of it. And from what we understand from scripture, we should expect that we're going to have a much larger and more thorough understanding of that and as as we are shaped by Christ. And I know it's late and probably too late for this question. And this question can lead us perhaps into another conversation on another day. Let's do it. But but here's a good here's a question for you guys to ponder. Where is the kingdom of heaven? And does it have locality? Can you yes. get there? Could you physically traverse to there? If you had access to unlimited technology. Well, and you got rid of your cataracts. Okay. Could you get I mean, you, you would have to have the perceptual ability to see into the other extra dimensional uh, real or physical dimensions of our reality, probably. I mean, obviously, we're going to ponder this. Because you just asked us to, so we're going to think about this. But and yeah, is, and is this why Tim Alberino is in Montana? Just well, I'm adding to the questions. For, <laughs> hey, you know, on. we used I'm to in Montana because Montana, as far as I'm concerned, is the is the best state in America. But um, that's another discussion. But it is another the, discussion. The idea is, I, the, the idea is, is you know. <laughs> we know there's eating and drinking in heaven. Is that extra dimensional eating and drinking? <laughs> Or is it just eating and drinking? No, so, it's just really good, really good eating. If and it's drinking. just eating and drinking, then I'm going to tell you, and then I'm going to suggest that you can get there. Yeah. If you had right. access to unlimited technology, you could get there. It's a place. It's inside of our universe. So a whole other rabbit trail is the whole near death experiences. It, and if I don't know if we, we've gone through, um, we interviewed John Burke. He wrote "Imagine Heaven" and "Imagine the God of Heaven." And he talks like he's interviewed lots of people with NDEs and they talk about experiencing uh, extra dimensions. And, you know, a big theme in that book is people are just grasping at the bounds of language, trying to describe things that are beyond what they can actually describe from their experience. But a, a common theme is that they, describe extra dimensions well they and they put it in they put it in this extra dimensional language because it's very hard to describe but not everybody means the same thing because the other thing that they all describe exactly. is going from point to point they, right. they say I, I was here and i traveled at high speed over to here and i arrived somewhere i mean that's a very common thing so it, it's, it's the same it's, thing it's, as the the, the regression therapy the regression therapy for ufo abductees right? They describe physical displacement from point A to point B, even if it's not under their own control or their power. It's like, oh, they floated me through the wall. Well, why did they have to float you through the wall? If they went to another, another, you know, alternative parallel dimension, parallel universe, they could have just snap, you're there. But that's not how anyone describes it. There's always why, this feeling of bother, locomotion. Why bother putting you in a craft of transportation? Yeah, why, why do if that? There's nowhere to specific to go. And people are yeah. using the extra dimensional language because of the conditioning from entertainment. So just because they're using that language doesn't mean that they know what the heck they're talking about. They're just trying to explain something that is outside of their normal experience. There's something that they cannot yeah. really describe. And I love when people say, I had this experience and I was in a spiritual body. And I say, well, how'd you know were you in a spiritual body? Well, I just, I was in this, I was, I was like, I wasn't in my body anymore. I said, okay, did you have hands? Well, yeah. Did you Whoopsie. did you feel something? Did you feel they're like, oh yeah, and I was in this beautiful place. I was like, how did you perceive this place? 
well, I, I could feel this beautiful breeze, but so you had skin. Well, I mean, did you get eyes? Were you in a body? Or were you just like sort of a wraith, like a like a wisp of wind? And what what happens is if you if you if you if you continue this line of inquiry, what they describe is a body. <laughs> what they describe is something exactly like this body, right? Very much so. Yeah. And it's well, like in the Witch not of Endor. Really describing something different. So so one thing to always keep in mind with with a lot of this stuff, whether it be UFO stuff or near death experiences, is our brains are very powerful. We don't understand consciousness. Human perception is very easy to ma manipulate. And I don't mean this in the wrong way, but you know, the, the easiest way to, to think about this is we read about all of these people in the Old Testament, all of these prophets who had these encounters. They had, they went, they saw this, they saw that, they saw angels, they went up here, they went up there, you know, they were taken to the throne room of God. And and and, and what I think people forget is that none of those guys went anywhere. None of them went anywhere. They have visions. All of the experiences were visionary. Dreams and visions. Where's your body when you're dreaming? It's in the bed. Where's your body when you're having a vision? It's wherever you happen to be sitting or standing. Okay? You're not going anywhere. All of this is happening inside of your perception, inside of your consciousness, your mind, or whatever you want to call it. So there's a, we are connecting, we're plugging into something, and this is the way that God communicates with us so often through visions and dreams, not so often, I mean, you know, the, the prophets, let's say in the Old Testament, but guess what? We can plug into this thing in a, let's say, perhaps in an illicit way as well. It's called ayahuasca, psilocybin, LSD, <laughs> where people are sitting, yeah. you know, you can have somebody tripping on LSD, you know, rolling around on the ground in their mind, they're riding a unicorn, you know, on a rainbow. That's where they are, but they're not there. They're right there in front of you. You see them, but they're not there in their mind. They're not there in their mind. And for all intents and purposes, where they are in their mind is just as real as where their body is. Right? So this is something we always have to keep in mind. We do not understand human consciousness. We don't understand it. It's, it's, it, is a, it is largely a mystery still to the human species. We don't understand it. So this idea that this, this, the, the power of perception, the perception is in play all the time. So essentially, the prophets were having, a, were having their perception hijacked in order for a message to be delivered to them. They're not being picked up and brought into heaven. It's not even, even by the way, in Enoch, if you read the book of Enoch carefully, you're going to realize that the book of Enoch, the entirety of Enoch's experience is in, dream, is, is in a dream state. So it's, it's, we have this misconception, oh, Enoch went to heaven and saw X, Y, and Z, not according to the book of Enoch. According to the book of Enoch, Enoch was sleeping and he saw X, Y, and Z. Now, was he taken to heaven after he saw X, Y, and Z in a dream state? That's actually debatable. But, um, and there's, you know, I'm, I'm producing my own book of Enoch with commentary and introduction and so forth. I'm actually doing it with Nate and Luke from Blurry Creatures, and that's coming out soon. So I've been, I've, I've had to read through, I've had to read through the book of Enoch more times than I want to believe me for did, editing purposes. So you, uh, if, if, if they produce a commentary on Enoch, they can no longer say we're just dummies asking questions because it, that, that's getting full. That's right. They always say that. Produce the commentary. So, yeah. they can still okay. say that. <laughs> so, so they can still say that. But <laughs> did you, did, have you looked at, me. No, did you look at Heiser's uh, commentary on the book of Enoch? What'd you say? Did you look at Heiser's? Uh, no, I, I haven't actually. I've never, I've never actually read a commentary on the Book of Enoch. So he, he, well, what he wrote was a little two-volume companion to the Book of Enoch that I just recently got a copy of. I didn't had not known that he'd done it when he was alive, but so I'm interested to to, to go through it and just kind of look through it and see what he says about the different passages. Yeah, I'm familiar with. Um, his general commentary on the Book of Enoch and his lectures and so forth. I've just never actually read a volume on uh, on the Book of Enoch or commentary from from Heiser, but I think I'm pretty familiar with a lot of his positions in regard to Enoch. 
So anyway, we could go on and on and on and on all night talking about the locality of the kingdom of heaven and consciousness and, and supernaturalism. But I suppose we have to stop at some point, right? Well, uh, we, we have to at least take a bio break and come back to it. So we, uh, I, this has been a fantastic conversation and we, uh, we, we really appreciate it. And I think this is, oh, there we go on screen. That's, uh, that's what of, it looks like. That's, but there. it's like I said, it's literally two volumes. It's not one volume. So, so, well, uh, my Tim commentary Alberino. is not that exhaustive. I can assure you. <laughs> <laughs> I actually only offer commentary. By the way, by the way, this is an important point. I only I only offer commentary for the Book of the Watchers. Right. The Book of Enoch is separated into various sections. Three books. Yeah. Those sections, by the way. Well, I'm not, I'm even talking about First Enoch. First Enoch is 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 divided into various sections. Those sections are not composed by the same author. That's apparent. And. And there are some, the first two sections, the Book of the Watchers and the Book of Parables, I consider to be more, um, let's say, to have more validity than the latter sections, especially when you get into um, the Book of the Heavenly Luminaries, then you're, start, you're getting into Merkaba mysticism there. So it's, the Book of Enoch is not, it's a very complex, uh, somewhat convoluted manuscript, but I will say this. First Enoch, and the reason why I only provide commentary for rather uh, the Book of the Watchers, the first section of First Enoch, is because that's the historical narrative. Everything after that is um, is visionary, is metaphorical. The, the historical narrative of Enoch is with is contained within the Book of the Watchers, and then what comes after the Book of the Watchers is the Book of Parables, and the Book of Parables is. Uh, largely, it's messianic content pertaining to Jesus yeah. of Nazareth. Well, you're on the same page with them because the first volume is a commentary on the Book of the Watchers, and the second volume is a commentary on the parables, and that's it. And you know what? If I were going to write commentary, those are the only two sections I would write it for. Indeed, I only wrote it for the Book of the Watchers. But in my introduction to Enoch, I get a lot into the parables. The parables are yeah. incredible. The parables are the validation of First Enoch. Um, so the first two sections of the, of, of the Ethiopic Enoch, First Enoch, I believe are authentic and are certainly written long before Christ and indeed may have actually been, could have been, could have been penned by Enoch himself or copies of copies of copies of some manuscript or um, the result of um, the result of a transcription from oral tradition that comes from that comes from the antediluvian world. So, um, or telepathic tradition. We're we, we're 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 uh, we're we're uh, uh, tumbling <laughs> down a rabbit hole here. But uh, anyway, um, I I I think we should probably put a put, put a, a lid put on a this pin in it. Yeah. Well, it, it's it's been an absolute uh, pleasure, uh, Tim. Thanks so much for joining us. Absolutely. And I, I hope I, 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 you're sensing, and I hope our audience is too. There's there's a lot more where where uh, where th where that comes from, and we'd be happy to have as as much and as lengthy a conversation as you're up for because I, I this stuff is very very important. It's important for people to be considering. It's important for people to be pushed. And what we see as a result of conversations like this is people taking scripture more seriously. It, it, it magnifies Christ. It, it turns people to the face of Christ and understanding who he is and understanding the necessity of salvation and the necessity of righteous living. And they open their New Testament. They look at the epistles and they go, oh, I, th I think I understand what he's talking about now. I understand why these verses are in here. And we we had some some beautiful moments of of just referencing the practicality of those things. So I, I thank you uh, from the bottom of my heart for the, your obedience to the calling that God has put on your life and the work he's having you do. And I think that I, I, I don't think we have any real concept of, of how important it is and how he's using that. And I think when we get to the other side and, and we see more with fewer cataracts, then I think we're going to see all kinds of, of ripples and, and, this conversation and so many like it are helping people understand Christ. It's helping people turn to Christ. And that's, that's what we're doing here. And that's the fun of it. And that's why, that's why it's always worth the time and the effort to continue that. So thanks so much for joining us. 
I, by the grace of God, we'll do it again. Keep up the good work with what you're doing. We've benefited tremendously from all the the hard labor that you've put in over time. And this conversation has just been a, a joy from beginning to end. So we appreciate it. Well, thank you, gentlemen. The pleasure was all mine, I assure you. And uh, we'll, we'll have to have a part two to this discussion. I'm just Let's getting going. It. That's it. Yeah, awesome. I know. We'll, we'll, we'll do it. I'm an entire <laughs> cup of coffee. So <laughs> no, I love it. someone <laughs> has rightly remarked that you can tell how well Tim's brain is working by the amount of sips of his coffee that he's taken. So by the time I get to the there, bottom there of this cup, I'm just, I'm just getting started. So, well, right. I, I said normally, you know, when I'm on, on this podcast, I'm sitting in my man cave, smoking my pipe and you've been holding that cigar the entire time. And I'm like Jones and now, so <laughs> <laughs> Brian's not going to bed after this. He's going straight out to his shed. So that's right. Dan's going right. to bed. Dan's on East coast time. So he'll, he'll go to bed. It's, it's morning where he is. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, Mr. Bible on listeners and watchers for the first time, uh, thank you so much for joining us. And we look forward to the next episode.